Thank you for watching this sermon from Kings Park International Church. Be sure to check out the other sermons in this series as well. Happy Mother's Day one more time. Um, not sure what type of traditions that you have in your family. My husband and I had very different types of traditions for Mother's Day um, growing up. But for me, I uh, rem- one of the things that I remember most about Mother's Day is flowers, like we you know, see the pictures of flowers. But specifically what I remember is having to wear a flower. As a kid, I grew up in the kind of tradition where everyone wore a flower to Sunday service. If your mother had passed away, you wore a white flower in memory of your mother. And if your mother was still alive, you wore a red flower. And so, you know, I was always getting stuck with pins, you know, on Mother's Day as a kid, of course, having to dress almost like, as like, like, like Easter kind of dress and everything. And I also remember it was a very big deal for my mom to um, get a nice corsage and her sisters to get a nice corsage for my grandmother. My grandmother was widowed early in life and raised three daughters on her own. And so her daughters made sure that she was honored every year. And so I'm thankful to have had them in my life. My mom is still with us. I'm very thankful that she knows my kids and we get to celebrate with her. Um, Motherhood has also been a huge part of my life. I had my first child at 23 years old and uh, he is now 23 himself. And so most of my adult life, I've been a parent. And so I'm thankful to be able to share with you all today on Mother's Day. And so we're going to uh, pray and then read the scripture and get into our message today, okay? Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just give myself to you Lord, I pray that you would use my words, Lord, my language, my mind, oh God, my body to communicate your message to us so that we can know you. And God, I pray that you would open up our hearts to receive the words that you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, and so we're gonna be looking um, primarily at Genesis 1 through 3, but very specifically at Genesis 1, 26 through 28. So let's read that passage together. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. And so what we're gonna look at today as we we study this passage and, and a few other passages in Genesis is we're gonna see that God as a parent provides purpose, I'm sorry, power, place, and purpose for his children. 
And then we're also going to talk about how we as parents or in parenting types of relationships can, can do the same thing, can bear God's image in those relationships. Now, you may not be a parent, but we are all children and we all have re family relationships. And so I hope that there's something that you can glean from this as we talk about God as our parent, not only in your role as a parent or an authority figure or a leader, but also in your understanding of how God loves you and what he provides for you as his child. Now, you may be asking yourself, as I ask myself lots of questions all the time, why would we be talking about family relationships in a Sunday service? We, you know, really prioritize, we wanna know God. So why are we talking about family relationships? It's not just because it's Mother's Day. There's not like Mother's Day in the Bible. Uh, we're not pulling from that. We are talking about parenting and about family relationships uh, on this Mother's Day because we see uh, references to family relationships all throughout the Bible. And the primary place or the first place that I think about really seeing this in the Bible is when God is referred to as a father. And we also see that Jesus is referred to as a son. And so there's something about understanding our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that is important uh, to, in understanding there's something we can glean from father-child relationships and from family relationships. And the other reason that family, and we might wanna talk about family when we're doing studying our Bible or here on a Sunday service is because we see genealogies all throughout scriptures. Genealogies are lists of kinship. And from the Old Testament, up until Jesus comes to the earth, the story of the Bible is built around and is told through these family lines. And so family has this prominent place throughout the scripture. We also see that New Testament writers, when they're speaking of the people who have placed their hope in Jesus and who are following Jesus and who first formed the community of the church, when the New Testament writers are instructing these people, he often, they, they often instruct them in ways and in analogies that are like family relationships. So much so that we call ourselves brothers and sisters. And so family has this primary place in the Bible. And so we talk about family relationships, not just because it's Mother's Day, but because we see this all throughout scripture. And so if we see these relationships and analogies to these relationships all throughout scripture, then my next question is, well, then how are we supposed to live in them? And so in, just like anything else, when we ask ourselves about how we should live, we wanna go right back into scripture. And we wanna say, what do we see happening here? How is God behaving, so to speak? How is he being? What is Jesus doing? What is his life like? And how does that inform me to live? And there are many places in scripture that we could look for clues and instructions and understanding about that. But in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, I think there's a lot of information, a lot to be learned there. And also in the, in the first three chapters of Genesis as a whole. Because we see in this passage that God has made mankind in his image. He's made us in his image to reflect him so that others can know him, so that we can live like him in the earth. And the things that I see in this passage in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, that God is providing for his children as a father is he's providing them power, he's providing them place, and he's providing them purpose. And so then I ask myself as a parent or as a leader or as someone in a mentor, mentee type of relationship, how should I then follow God in, in providing or empowering my children? How should I provide place to them and how do I guide them in their purpose? And so that's what we're going to look at today. So the first thing is power. God is providing power to Adam and Eve in this passage. And the, where I see that is if I look in the previous verses, Genesis 1 through 25, what I'm gonna see is a, is a telling of creation. 
And I'm gonna see that God makes an expanse and he puts stars in it. He makes a sky and puts birds in it. I'm gonna see that he makes a sea and puts fish and sea creatures there and land and, and creates roaming animals. And so up until this verse 26, God is doing all of this creative work. And so when God says that he is making mankind in his image, then there is something about us that has the ability to create, that has creative power. There's an author, Andy Crouch, who wrote a book entitled Playing God, and he speaks about this. He defines power as the ability to create something in the earth and, and refers to this passage. And I see it, I can connect with that. And so God provided power to Adam and Eve, his children. So what does that mean for us as parents? Well, we then have to figure out how to empower, by God's grace, to empower our children. And there are some aspects of this power that we can understand or this giving of power or this empowerment when we look at God. In this moment, God gives power. He, he makes Adam and Eve in his image, but there's not like he lost power. It's not like he gave a part of himself and then he's less than. He's still whole, he's still intact, and yet he has empowered Adam and Eve and given them the ability to create. And so when we as, as parents empower our children, it does not mean that somehow we lose part of our person, we lose part of who we are when we empower our children. No, because we are created in the image of God, we are able to empower them without also losing who we are as an individual. This example can also be seen in the person of the Trinity. In the Trinity, in our, in our God, we see that there are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And in those three persons, there's, a, there's an individuality, and yet there is so much giving to the other individuals within the Trinity that they are one. And so in our relationships with our children, we can empower them as individuals and maintain a relationship with them. Now, this was a very difficult concept, I should not say concept, but an idea for me to grasp. I really had, I did not understand this as a young parent at all. I really saw my role primarily to be uh, teaching my children to obey. And that if I taught them to obey as a Christian parent, then they would then in turn obey God. And so what that really worked out to being is a lot of control, trying to control everything they did. And if you have been a parent or if you've babysat, you'll know you can't control children. You cannot control other people. And so early on in parenting, this idea I be began to be challenged. And honestly, my husband from the very time that we had kids was like, I don't think I see this in God. I don't think this is his primary thing, though obedience is important. And so in this journey of parenting, I was driving along one day and the Lord began to show me a picture of my body. It's like I saw my arm and I felt in my spirit, I felt God saying, your children are not like your arm. They're not a limb, they're not a leg. They are their own people. I have created them. They're an individual. And it changed the way that I thought about them. And I began to respect them. And it was a long journey for us, but to respect them as individuals and my role in empowering them and also having relationship with them. And so as parents, we want to empower our children to create something in the world just like the father empowered Adam and Eve when he made them in his image. Now, God not only provided power for Adam and Eve, I also see in Genesis that he provides place for them. We're gonna jump over to Genesis 2, 8 through 15, and we find a passage there that is bounded by two uh, by one phrase in two places. In verse eight and for verse 15, there's a repeated phrase and in different translations, it's, the words are slightly different, but basically it says that God put Adam in the garden. And when we see phrases like that repeated, 
we want, it should tell us there's something that's sandwiched in between that we should really pay attention to. And so in the story of creation, what we see sandwiched in between is the description of the place that God put Adam, the description of Eve. I'm sorry, the description of Eden. And so we want to pay attention to what this is telling us. And so what we see here is that Eden was a garden where things were flourishing, where things were growing, the plant life was wonderful, there was an abundance. And then we also see that there were four rivers running through it, that it or from it, and that it was a well-watered place. And, and, and because it is a place, it is Eden, there is the implication that there are also boundaries to it. And so God not only provided power, he not only empowered Adam and Eve, but he set them in the garden with that power. And for me, I see this testified in my own life, or I can testify to the power of place in my own life, because as a child, my family faced a lot of difficulties, a lot of difficulties throughout my childhood. And because of those difficulties, we had to move a lot. We did, I was, we did not have the situation where we lived in one or two houses. We moved quite a bit as children based because of the challenges we were facing. But my mother, every place that we went to, every home that we lived in, she prioritized. I mean, I really took it for granted. I didn't even realize that other people didn't have this. She prioritized creating a place for us, a safe place for us, a place where we could, we always had a dinner table. Dinners were very important, a place that we could gather around and share a meal in the evening. She always provided a place for us to sit, a nice, as, as nice as she could of a place for us to sit. It was always clean and tidy. It was very important for the place to be warm and safe and comforting and always a bedroom with, with, with good linens and, and we always had to make our bed. And so the keeping of our place was very important. And so through a lot of challenging situations, I realized I had this comfort of place. And my grandmother did the same thing. And I see this in, the, in Eden. I see that God has provided this secure and well-watered place for Adam and Eve. And so what does that mean for us as parents specifically? We then are called to provide place for our children. Now, some of, I mean, you know, like we have to do this by law in our country is provide a secure place for our play, children to come into and be out of the elements. And so we accept that pretty easily. Yeah, Dana, that makes sense. But I want to address also that in our day and age, it is important as parents to also provide a place where our children and our families, even for me now with grown children, where they can come out of the virtual world and be together. That we can, just like we come out of the elements and come inside a boundary place in a home, that there's, we provide spaces and places where we come out of the virtual world and are together. There are so many things going on, whether it's, you know, there's so, when I say virtual world, everything from, you know, me, Jen Exer watching movies, you know, streaming TV shows to my kids on social media. The, the primary thing in my house is video games. That's the primary media, form of media that is, that is participated in at our house. Whether it's social media, but even the virtual world of school, the virtual world of work, I believe that we can um, help our children to flourish and help our families to flourish by providing spaces in our homes and spaces in our lives where we come out or come in from the virtual world to a safe place where we dwell together. And there are, of course, many ways to do that. My husband and I, it's different now with children, but my husband and I, we always made sure that our computer was in one spot. Nobody had computers or or phones or anything like that in their, in their rooms. It was all in the family room. We usually just had one television in a public space so that most of the spaces in our home were, were free from the virtual world. And then also at, our, at the dinner table, we, we prioritized one meal a day with our children when they were young. And that was not a place where we partook of, of different media. And so that's just one example. There are many, many ways. But I believe in our day and age that we do need to provide place uh, that is free from the virtual world or so that our children can flourish just like Adam and Eve had the opportunity to flourish in Eden. 
And we also provide place just by making relational time and relational space for our children, time to connect with them. And so God provided power, creative power, and then he set Adam and Eve in a place, a specific place, that had boundaries with that power. Now finally, what I see God providing here is purpose. He provides purpose for them. And the purpose that Adam and Eve had is directly connected with the place and the power. In Genesis 2, 15, just after the author writes or that Adam was put, that God put Adam in the garden, it says that, and to work it, to toil it. Again, different translations use different words, but there was a purpose that he was given in the place that he had and to use the power that he had as an image bearer. And that purpose was to work the land, was to work the ground. He wasn't told to build houses. He wasn't told to be a seamstress. He was told to do the thing that makes most sense in the place where he was and to utilize the power that God had given him. We see this also back in Genesis 1, 28 in the passage that we read at the beginning. God had made Adam and Eve as man and woman and he'd given, and as image bearers, they had this creative power. And then he gives them the purpose of multiplying. And so they were together and they had this power to create. And that is what God, that is one of the purposes that he gave to them. And so we see that sometimes we think about purpose and we go, there's such a mystery about what our purposes are in life. But if we look to this example, our purpose is directly connected with the place God has put us in and the power that he has given us. Now I have tested, I have lived this out. When I was a young mother, um, when Jason and I met in in high school and in college, right after I got out of high school and we got married at the end of my college career, and then, like I said, started having children at 23. Neither one of us came from homes where a parent stayed home. That was not a model in our homes or our, our grandparents' homes. Every, I mean, everyone worked. Um, and so, but when we were married, we just had this dream of being able to live this life of one of us staying home. And so it's something that we, we just wanted from the beginning of our marriage. Now, as we plan to have kids, Jason because he's a very generous and kind man, he offered, he said, hey, I'm willing to do it. But if you could look at our college transcripts and the jobs that we had in college, it was very clear that though we both had engineering degrees, he was definitely the one God had gifted to be an engineer. So I said, I think this is a very clear clear path to take. And so I began to stay at home with my children. Having never witnessed this as a uh, a child growing up, I, I mean, this was going to be all roses. This was like, they're going to be amazing. I was just going to like run through the fields of flowers with my children. And it was going to be lovely. And three years in, we had, or four years in, we had three children and in three and a half years, I found myself going, "Mm, no, no, I'm not really. I'm not really interested in this life anymore. I was not the kind of child that grew up thinking about getting married or having families. I mean, I was a total, I mean, we didn't use STEM then, but I was totally a STEM kid. I was all into math and science. I went to be a chemical engineer. I was planning on being a plant manager because that's what I knew from my childhood, you know, in manufacturing. I, there were no dreams of this. So when God led me down this, I just thought, well, this is just gonna be amazing. And then my daughter was about six months old. I was like, yeah, I don't think I want to do this anymore. (laughs) And so I began to tell God for about six months, yeah, I don't want to do this. This is my plan. And I began to make a 30-year career plan for myself. I wrote it out. I wrote steps. At the beginning of it, I specified people in my community that I needed to speak to to begin making these things. I talked to my grandmother because she loves Jesus. I'm like, do you think this is okay? She's like, well, sure, you know, and whatever. And she was supportive. And so I just began telling God for six months. Okay, God, this is the plan. This is what I'm gonna do. And hey, I need a mentor. Can you send me a mentor for this? I started volunteering in different community organizations so I could like, network and begin to build my resume. It's really ironic because one of the organizations just stuck me in a room in the back to do like sorting and stuff. But 
But this is what I was telling God for six months and nothing was ever happening. And I was like, okay. And so about six months in, Jason and I went to visit some of his, like people, mentors of, of his. And sometimes when you get out of your space, you can hear and think a little clearer. And so while I was there, after six months of telling God what I wanted and telling him what I needed, there was this moment, a very quiet moment as I was walking around these people's houses that I just felt God impress upon me, be excellent with what's in front of you. And I still can feel it. Like even now, I said it in the first service too, but I still get chills when I say it because it was such a defining moment Because in that season of life, when I was struggling with purpose and I was just trying to define it myself, God said, be excellent with what's in front of you. And that is what I see in Genesis. Because the jobs that he gave, the purpose that he gave, Adam and Eve, were directly connected with what was in front of them. It was connected to the place where they were And it was using the power that they had. And though that phrase set me on a course and has really defined how I discern what God is doing in my life. And I thought at that time that I would be a stay at home, you know, I thought I'd be a kept woman my whole life, but um, that didn't happen. So uh, here I am. But But that still defines me, be excellent with what's in front of you. And many times we struggle to know our purpose. And I would say, look at what God has provided you in power and place and connect those things and you will begin to understand your purpose. As parents, as leaders, as mentors, it is very important that when those that we are parenting, those that we are leading are struggling with purpose, that we help guide them in it by helping them look around and see the place God has put them in and the power that he's given them to create in that place. And so this is what I see God has given us as his children. Power, place, and purpose. I see this in the beginning of Genesis, but I actually see these same things throughout the Bible. Whenever God is establishing relationship with people, I see these things show up. I see it show up when he is establishing a relationship with Noah. I see it show up when he's establishing relationship with Abraham, when he's establishing relationship with Moses and the Israelites and David. And I see it when Jesus is establishing relationship with us. And this relationship that has power and place and purpose in it is called a covenant. And covenant is the basis of relationship that God has with his people all throughout the Bible. And the covenant that Jesus establishes that we call the new covenant, it also has power and purpose and place. You see, we have power as followers of Jesus because Jesus rose from the dead. And when we put our faith in him, we have power to overcome death and sin. Jesus also provides place for us. Ultimately, he provides place for us When he, in John 14 says, before his crucifixion, I go to make a place for you. And we see that place described at the end of the Bible in in the last two chapters of Revelation, that there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And that there'll be a time that he returns and there will be like a new Eden for us where we can dwell with perfect power and place and purpose. And in this new Eden that Jesus is providing for us, our purpose is to know God. Our purpose is to worship God. That's our primary purpose. And so we turn right back to what Genesis, God intended in Genesis through these covenant relationships that we have with God. And as parents who are image bearers, who are made in the image of God, we want to ask the Lord for the grace to walk in covenant relationship with our children, providing these three things as well. Now, I know that this sounds, you're, you're, I know you gotta be thinking, well, that sounds nice, but that's not real life. 
Because family relationships are hard. They're difficult. There's a lot of pain. And you may be a parent who has offered to the best of your ability, a covenant love, a covenant relationship with your children. But your children have misused the power that you've provided or they've, they've misused the place or, or, or left it or they've rejected the purpose that, that you're guiding them in. And to you, first of all, I want to say, I'm very sorry. I know that's extremely painful. It's extremely painful. And there's a significant amount of mourning and lament when that happens. But I also want to say to you that in Genesis 3, we can learn something about how to live as image bearers when we are in parenting relationships and our children are rejecting the covenant love that we're offering them. You see, in Genesis 3, that's exactly what Adam and Eve did. They rejected this covenant love that God had offered them. And in Genesis 3, 7, we see that they're naked and ashamed of one another, hiding from each other and hiding from God. And God, our example of the perfect parent, he comes to them, he pursues them, he walks, and some, some interpretations are walking, that it was not just one walk, but there was a time of walking in the garden in the cool of the day to pursue Adam and Eve, and then he asked them, where are you? And so we see that God the Father in this situation where his children have rejected his covenant love pursues them, and he pursues them patiently. And this is the story of the Bible. This is the story of the Bible. God patiently pursuing his people because he wants to offer us power and place. He wants us to walk in his purposes. And he does this by continuing to patiently pursue us. And ultimately, this pursuit is given in the sending of Jesus. But what I also see in Genesis 3 at the end is that though there were consequences for what Adam and Eve had done, and in covenant relationships with our children or those that we are leading, sometimes there are boundaries we have to place. Sometimes people can't stay in the place that we, we've provided for them. And there were consequences for Adam and Eve. But even in that moment, and in that moment of shame, where they didn't want to even look at one another, God the Father, the perfect parent, provided a covering for them so that they could be with one another with at least less shame, without shame. And again, if we look throughout Scripture, we see that's what God does for us. Throughout Scripture, and ultimately, this is what Jesus provides for us. When he went to the cross and his blood is shed and it covers our sin, just like the skin that God the Father covered Adam and Eve with. There was a shedding of blood. Here Jesus sheds blood and his blood covers us and he covers our shame. And so when we are in relationships with, with our children or those that we are leading and they are rejecting us, this is, our, this is how we bear God's image, by patiently pursuing and by rejecting the temptation to shame people and doing everything we can to cover them. And you may also be a child here and you go, yeah, this sounds great, but I have not had parents that offered me something like this. And they may have done something much worse. I mean, something that is really opposite of this. And again, I'm very sorry. I know that you walk with a mourning and lament. I know that you walk with absence and that there's nothing that can replace your biological parents. That that is a, that is a mourning that you'll walk with. But I am here to say that there is hope because God is our perfect parent for every single one of us. He is the perfect parent for us. And we can be, live in this covenant relationship with him and receive what he provides for us and walk in purpose. And God has also provided a house, a church, the Father's house that we sang about today, that we can come in where there are people that we can also walk in family relationships with. They don't replace our biological family, but they certainly uh, help us walk in hope and healing 
in this life. And so I wanna pray for us today. I wanna pray for you if you fall in one of those categories. I want you to know that Christ died both for the child who rejects covenant and for the parent who doesn't offer it. That Christ died for them and, and you can look to the cross and know that though you have been wronged, Jesus has died for those that wrong you and you can walk in forgiveness because Christ died for them. I also want you to know that as you bear your cross, walking in relationship where you are patiently pursuing and covering, that you are identifying with Christ and that, the, that he will uphold you and strengthen you as you patiently pursue those children. And so let us pray together. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you, mighty God of heaven, that you are a perfect father. And God, I thank you that we have this word and we can look into it to know how we should live. And God, we are asking you right now for the grace to be image bearers, to walk as image bearers. This is what we were created for. So Lord, would you come, Lord, and help us to be those who empower, to be those who provide place and who guide others into purpose. And Holy Spirit, I welcome you into our hearts, to all of the wounded places, to the places where we are mourning because of loss, where those that we love have rejected this covenant. Lord, or those that should have offered covenant love to us did not. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in now. Would you come and heal the broken places of our heart? Would you come and witness to us of the perfect Father? And would you give us hope about the place, the perfect place, the new heaven and the new earth that we are to live in when Jesus returns? Lord, we thank you for your constant pursuit of us. We welcome you into our lives. We welcome you into our hearts and into our families. In Jesus' name, amen. There may be those of you here, I'm talking about this covenant love of God, and you may not have ever seen that and or known that God was offering you power or purpose or place. But I'm here to say this is what God has offered you, a covenant love, a covenant love. And for those of you who have received this love of God, we want to constantly remind ourselves of what God has done for us, renewing our covenant with God. And we do that through this prayer of salvation at the end of the service every week. And so we're gonna pray this prayer together to renew and to receive it fresh, this love that God has provided us. And I invite any of you who have never received this to pray with us. Please pray after me. Heavenly Father, Thank you for creating and loving me. I confess that I have sinned and I ask you to forgive me. Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for making me a new person. Holy Spirit, empower me to follow you and to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching. If you have questions or prayer requests, please email us at info at kingspark.org or message us on one of our social media channels. If you would like to give, you can do so by visiting kingspark.org giving or by downloading the Kings Park app.